Distinguished guests and fellow colleagues, welcome to today's lecture series organized by the Center for Livable Cities, CLC. My name is Mayers. CLC is a knowledge center jointly established in 2008 by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources. Our mission is to distill, create and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The center's work involves three main areas, research, capability development and promotions. CLC Lecture Series provides a platform for urban thought leaders and experts to exchange ideas and share knowledge. In today's session, we are honoured to have with us our guest speaker, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, Global Strategist at Deutsche Bank and President of the Sustainable Planet Institute. Mr. Sanyal will start off the session with a short presentation on using walking and cycling as a design paradigm for cities. Following the lecture, we would have a moderated panel dialogue and we are privileged to have with us three panellists today and that is Mr. Andrew Fassam, Senior Director, Conservation and Urban Design Group at the URA, Mr. Stephen Goh, Executive Director of Orchard Road Business Association and Mrs. Onko Wina, Director for the Architecture and Commuter Infrastructure Development at the Land Transport Authority. There will also be a question and answer session for the audience, which will be moderated by Professor Paul Butter of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Well, without further ado, let's put our hands together to invite Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal on stage. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to talk about one of my pet uh, themes, which is walkability. So I'm going to talk about the walkable city. And it requires a little bit of explanation of why we, in the 21st century, want to talk about the most basic form of transportation, which is walking. Now, if you are a urban designer or urban planner, um, and you're asked to go about building a new city or redesigning a new city, you're immediately given a long list of things that you are supposed to cover. Now, I've just given here three of the sort of big uh, areas that you are definitely supposed to cover if you were designing for a 21st century city. And you'd be told, you know, we live in a time of climate change, we certainly want to make our um, cities environmentally sustainable. They should need low energy and ecological footprint. We want them to be dense. We want minimized land use. You want public transport and so on. So one big area that you will be asked to sort of try and plan for will be environmental sustainability. The second big area that you will be asked to think about will be about making that city that you create economically sustainable. So you will be to talk about human clustering, networks, random exchange of ideas, urban buzz, and so on. So again, one very big area of work that you will be asked to think about. And the third big area that you will be asked to think about is to create a city that is socially sustainable. You want the quality of life, you want to talk about clustering of amenities, you want health, you want to make it socially inclusive of all classes of society, and so on and so forth. So these are the three broad categories of things that any uh, person thinking about cities of the future has got to think about. But it is not enough to think about these, because this was in some ways always true. When you're planning a 21st century city, however, you've got to also think about how fundamentally the way we live our lives is also changing in the 21st century. And I'm going to just take two things here which I think are important, which is this. First, that the regular cycles of 20th century life have broken down. Now, to understand this, think about it. I'm going to obviously oversimplify, but just to give you some example. 20th century urban life was you got up in the morning, had quick breakfast with your family, Kissed your, uh, if you were male, you kissed your um, uh, wife goodbye, got into your car in the suburb, drove down the highway, went to your office or factory or wherever, uh, uh, reached there by 9 o'clock, uh, you worked till 
took a short break in the company cafeteria for one hour or whatever, went back to your office, worked till six o'clock, then you got into your car and went home. And then maybe you uh, met your kids or wife or whatever for a little while, watched TV and went to sleep. That was at least, roughly speaking, what life in the 20th century uh, 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 city would have looked like. Unfortunately, that's totally not how we live our lives anymore. Uh, through the course of any day, uh, many of you will do the following. You will get up, you'll of course come to office, but somewhere after you will work on your office for work for a few, maybe an hour or something. Uh, uh, you'll check your Facebook. I know you, all of you do it. Uh, and then you will probably hop out across and have coffee with a friend who happens to be visiting from some other part of the world. Then you go back to office, work for a little bit longer, then you'll hop across and maybe go somewhere for a lunch presentation at the URA. And then you'll get back, and then you'll do some more little bit work, do some more Facebook, and then you'll decide you want to go to the gym. And then you'll come back, and um, by now it's become dark, uh, but you still have that conference call you need to do with New York, so you'll sit in office till 7 o'clock, do this conference call till 7.30 or whatever, then you'll hop into some form of transport, go home, meet your kids, hang around with them for a little while, and then at night, again, you may decide to go out and catch a movie, or, do, or maybe, unfortunately for people my, like myself, you might be catching a late night flight out to some other place. The point I'm making here is that there is no regular cycle in this. Through the course of the day, I've gone to five different places, done, <clears throat> met, uh, and in each case, I've required a different form of transport. And the old idea that you have these nice regular cycles for a very large part of the workforce has effectively broken down. And this is happening when another thing is happening, which is that the standard social unit, which in the old days was <clears throat> the nuclear family, you know, mom and dad and a bunch of kids, has also dissolved. In any city around the world, the anchoring uh, social unit is no longer any longer the nuclear family. Instead, you'll have um, singles. In many places, like for example in Germany, 39% of households are single, single individuals. Um, then you'll have couples, of course, couples with kids, couples without kids. Uh, then there'll be many multi-generation families. In fact, in many developed parts of the world, multi-generational families are actually making a comeback. And then there'll be a fair significant proportion of the population which is transient and unanchored. So there will be tourists, business travelers, students, consultants, temporary workers, construction workers of all kinds. So the point I'm making here is that any urban uh, <clears throat> uh, landscape ha is all about now multiplicity. You're the, you, through the course of any individual's day, he's using all kinds of transportation. And there are all kinds of people requiring different kinds of transportation. Far more than ever has been the case. So not only do you have the old standard paradigms, you're also dealing with a society that, that is you know, almost like an amorphous and ever-changing uh, mix of activity. So the question is, what is the importance of walkability in all this? Now, before I go into that, let me clarify what I mean by walkability. What I mean by walkability is that it is uh, thinking about urban design in terms of allowing an average citizen to be able to use walking as an important, if not dominant, mode of transport for work and leisure. Now, this is not just about creating some nice sidewalks. So it's, it's, there's a lot of things that go into this, that, which includes shade, it includes parks, public toilets, lighting, security and safety, accessibility for the, <coughs> for the disabled and the aged. But it also includes all kinds of things. I mean, in any city which is beyond you know, a very small one, you will need to enhance walking with all kinds of other things. For example, cycling or connections to public transport in many ways. So walkability is not just about walking itself, but all kinds of other things, including connecting through to other forms of transport. And of course, it includes soft factors like, as I said, security and safety, but also things like air quality. Now let us look at how these things uh, make an, uh, are important. Now walking, of course, is obvious. By definition, it's environmentally friendly, and cycling as well. I mean, 
there are a few other more friendlier ways of uh, getting from point A to point B from an environmental perspective uh, than simply walking there. However, obviously you will need to go much longer distances than you can simply walk to. And everybody will, of course, advocate public transport. But every form of public transport is ultimately based on walking. Because the last mile and the first mile has to be walked. Unless you happen to be very, very lucky and have a bus stop right in front of your door, everybody else <clears throat> walks a significant proportion. And so public trans designing for public transport at some level is essentially about designing for walking. And then, of course, there are all kinds of other things. For example, as is now uh, very widely uh, uh, accepted, that denser cities are environmentally much, much more friendly for a number of reasons. But of course, a density is a very important factor in walking. The denser the city, the lesser the distance you have to go, and consequently uh, makes... Um, so if you design for walking, you're not only designing for the act of walking, you're designing for public transport, you're de designing also a city that is fundamentally denser. This brings me to another issue that people uh, uh, think about uh, in urban design, which is the economic value of cities. If you had gone back 20 years ago and talked to uh, urban thinkers, they would have basically talked about the death of cities. Basically, the point they would have made is now, with internet, which internet, remember, 20 years ago was still quite new, and the idea was that now you have all this internet, you can all go and live very far away, you know, everybody can live on a ski slope or wherever, and nobody will actually live in a city because um, why would you want to live in a city um, and pay high rent when you can live in Aspen, Colorado and do all your work on internet? But it turns out, quite to the contrary, cities have enormous value um, that cannot be unwound through the internet. In fact, the last 20 years have been the greatest age ever of cities. And people are in fact moving back into the middle of cities and willing to pay higher and higher rents. Why? It turns out that there is huge value to the personal interactions that cities create. This is about urban buzz, it's about the exchange of ideas and creativity, it's about trust face-to-face, -face. it's about social groupings and the clustering of amenities that is simply not possible to do if you disperse it. And walking is a very important ingredient in this uh, urban buzz that generates so much economic value. As I've written over here, the street cafes of Paris, the New York Central Park, and the pubs of London have generated more great ideas than all the libraries and labs in the world. So there is huge value to creating areas where you can walk, interact, think, sit, exchange ideas. And so walking, oddly enough, is a very, very important economic generator. It, it may not be obvious to people, but you think of any great successful city and think of whether or not they're walkable. Almost all of them are walkable. The next thing that you want of a great city is, of course, social inclusion. And again, walking is, of course, the most um, socially inclusive way of getting about. There's no way you can, you can, you know, uh, you can do anything better than walking as far as social inclusion is concerned. The poor can walk, the rich can walk, everybody can walk. But, again, public transport is also a part of this. And I've got a photograph here of, the photograph there is of Churchgate Station in Bombay at PCAR. And you can see literally millions of people use it every day. Now this has a very interesting impact on Bombay as a city. Now, anybody who's visited Bombay will know that it is a city of extremes. Some of the richest people in the world live there, and some of the poorest people in the world live there. And yet, there has never been a riot in Bombay between the rich and the poor, despite the fact that the rich and the poor very often live right next to each other. Why? I mean, there are all kinds of other riots. You know, Hindus and Muslims have riots. There are riots between different uh, communities from different parts of the country, and so on, but never between rich and poor. Why? One of the key reasons for this, oddly enough, 
is the train, sy train system that I've just shown you. See, the traffic system in Bombay is so bad that whether you're rich or poor, you're forced to use the trains because that's the fastest way to get from point A to point B. And because you're forced to use the train and very often walk the last leg and the first leg, what happens is that there is Bombay is, even despite this very large differences in income, has a very egalitarian ethos. Because when you're traveling in a train, the guy sitting next to you may be on one side a taxi driver, and the other side he may be the CEO of a billion dollar company. And this has, and remember, people are doing this day in and day out. So there are, there are card, there are bridge clubs inside the train. There are singing clubs in the train, because people take the same train every day. And so this has created very interesting linkages. There are, there are, you know, I have myself experienced this. There are people who play bridge on the train. They put a box on, they bring a box, uh, and they put it between their knees because the trains, uh, the seats are facing each other, and they play bridge. And the people who are playing very often come from completely different social classes. And this creates a very interesting ethos. So Bombay, despite massive economic disparity, is possibly one of the most egalitarian cities in the world. And this is a part of this ecosystem of social, uh, that, that exists. So this brings me to why walkability. I mean, it's obviously it's cheap, it's low technology, it, it, it combines flexibly with other modes. Uh, it's also scalable. You can do it with big cities, you can do it with small cities. And of course, it simultaneously resolves um, environmental, social, and economic sustainability. So these, this is why it's an important, as a backbone system. Nobody is suggesting that you, you only allow walking in a city. But it can be, in a 21st century world, a backbone system, which allows you to mix and match through the day. As I said, the, prob the point about modern urban life is multipl multiplicity of different groups doing different things at different points in time requiring different urban uh, transport solutions. And walking as a backbone system, allowing you to flit between multimodal uh, ways of getting around is a very important part of thinking about all design solutions. This is something that all of you must have, or some of you may have, may have already seen. This is the space required to transport 60 people. And you can see what is needed by a car, a bus, and by bicycles. Uh, and of course, if you don't have bicycles, it's even less because the people walking is a tiny amount of space. So you can see the way, uh, you know, how uh, designing for uh, uh, walking slash uh, cycling is a fundamentally different way of thinking about urban design than thinking about it from the lens of cars. While what I've just said may be, at least to some of you, pretty obvious, the sad fact is that we are still building brand new cities which are essentially unwalkable. I'm giving you an example uh, from my own home country uh, and home city, Delhi. Uh, but this is true for many other parts of the world. This is Gurgaon. Uh, it's a brand new city built just south of Delhi. Uh, and you can see that it's completely brand new, and it's, it has no footpaths. It's a city of three and a half million people, and it has no footpaths. In fact, it doesn't even have proper bus stops. As you can see, the guy sitting on that box there, he's waiting for a bus. And this is not because of lack of, trans uh, lack of investment. As you can see, the serious heavy infrastructure has been built for cars. And this is a particularly shocking uh, drawing, and I'll tell you, uh, the, uh, photograph, and I'll tell you why. See this highway that you see here is called NH8, National Highway 8. It links Delhi to Gurgaon. Um, it's, as you can see, a very broad five lanes on each side, so 10 lane highway. And um, uh, cars going up and down. It also has buses going up and down. And um, this has, uh, 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 there's a very uh, uh, interesting thing that happens, is that even though it has lots of buses going up and down, and they are good new buses, air conditioned and everything, even at peak hour, those buses are half or almost all empty. Now, when I raise this issue with a number of uh, officials, uh, their response generally was, 
You know, the Delhiites are all proud, arrogant fellows. They won't use public transport. They all want to have their own car. So that is why the buses don't have anybody in them. Which is, of course, nonsense, because Delhi has a brand new metro system and everybody seems to use it. So why wouldn't they use buses? So I investigated the matter. And I found something which is quite obviously clear from just looking at this photograph. There's actually no way of crossing this road. You see, in a 22 kilometer stretch, there are exactly eight places where you can cross this highway. So if you happen to be using a bus, once a day you're on the wrong side of the road, and you can see there's a barrier going right through that completely disallows you from getting from one side to the other. So either you can catch the bus on going home, or you can catch the way coming in, but you can't catch it on both sides. So not surprisingly, not surprisingly, nobody uses a bus. If you can afford a Mobike, you will buy one. And this is a very simple illustration of how you've got everything there except the very cheapest thing, which is to create a small crossing every one kilometer or half a kilometer to allow people from go one side of the road to the other side. And this simple uh, mistake has meant that there is an expensive bus system which is simply not functioning. Now, I do want to clarify one thing, that creating walkability is not just about sidewalks. This is still the same city, Delhi. This is the center of Delhi. <coughs> this is where all the rich politicians live. And you can see there are actually good footpaths. This is what is called Lutian's Delhi. This is this capital. And yet, it too is not walkable. Because you see, walking is not just about creating footpaths and sidewalks and the hard infrastructure. It's also about the whole ecosystem that goes with it. For example, in Lutian's Delhi, there are no shops. There is no street life. It's very, very often unsafe. So in fact, if you wanted to live your life here by walking, you can't. There's nothing to do here. So the only thing you can do is to get onto your car and drive somewhere. So just having footpaths is not the solution to the problem. Now, the good news is that <clears throat> some parts of the world have begun to catch on to this. And I keep telling people the, the um, sign of prosperity and uh, uh, is ultimately not that everybody, all the poor people drive around in Ferraris, but that the rich walk. And I think that message is thankfully getting through at least in some cities. There are two photographs here. One on the left is Seoul. Uh, this is right in the middle of Seoul. There used to be an old river that, or stream that used to flow there. But in the uh, 70s, a very heavy... Um, uh, a road, a elevated road was built right through the heart of uh, the city to allow cars to go through. Um, a few years ago, it was pulled down, and this stream has been revived. And you can see it's a very popular place for kids, for uh, office goers at lunchtime to sit around, and it's really transformed the uh, middle of the city. But what is most amazing, it has made no difference to, uh, to the traffic proving what some designers had always argued, that all these, all these elevated highways, all they really do is redistribute the traffic jam. So here is one example in the case of Seoul, where they have revived the center of Seoul by simply reviving, of course, an old river, but also reviving an entire walking system along with it. There's also the example on the right, which is of New York. This is something called the High Line. This is in southern New York. This used to be an abandoned elevated train line going through the south of the city. When the underground systems were built, this train uh, uh, infrastructure kind of was disused and it was lying around for decades. And about, f about, a, about six, seven years ago, uh, somebody said, why don't we just tear it down? It's actually quite dangerous having all this infrastructure just lying around. It's, it leads to crime and so on. Till somebody, I think uh, an advisor to uh, Mayor Bloomberg said, why don't we rip out the train lines and turn this into a walking path, like a boardwalk kind of a thing, through the middle of southern Manhattan. And it has been enormously successful. It has transformed all the neighborhoods that it goes through. It's a wonderful place to walk. Uh, real estate prices in and around the High Line have actually gone up significantly. And it's a genuinely interesting addition 
to uh, the landscape of New York. So just two examples of hard walkability-oriented design proposals that have transformed uh, uh, major cities. But of course, um, walking is um, not just about walking, literally. Uh, there are other enhanced ways of walking. One of them, of course, is cycling. And there are cities which are doing this in a big way. Um, on the left is Zurich. That's me and my family in Zurich last year. Uh, and we cycled all over the center of Zurich because the municipality in Zurich actually gives out free cycles. There are cubicles all over the city. You can go there, give, your, give in your uh, IC, and they give you free cycles, and you can drive around, and you can drop it off wherever you wish along the system. Uh, of course, London has a similar system uh, with cycles, which has proved to be very, very popular. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that Singapore, which has historically been a very cycle-unfriendly city, has finally woken up to this. Um, and I personally actually cycle to work every day uh, and back. And this is a photograph of me, my cycle and my rucksack. Uh, you can pull out my rucksack just to prove it. Uh, <laughs> this is the same rucksack. Uh, and I live in Tanjong Ru, and every morning I cycle down the uh, Garden by the Bay on my side of the uh, uh, Kalang River, down to the um, barrage onto the other side, cycle back through Garden by the Bay on the other side, pass sands and I go to office uh, every day. And this has really transformed my life. In fact, the job I do, I can actually do it at sitting at home. I go to office largely because of the commute. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take you through is something I have been working on called the Global uh, Walkability Index. Um, it's got a number of uh, criteria, as you can see. Um, and I've used here, the first is pedestrian infrastructure, which includes pavements, overbridges, street lights, signage, and so on. Then there's connectivity, which is linkages to other forms of transport. Urban form, which is the ecosystem of shops, offices, mixed use, cafes, street life, and stuff like that. Uh, distance. Um, and for some reason, I've included air quality here because it sort of went there. And then safety, crime, policing, legal systems, emergency services, and so on. So using these criteria, I've tried to gauge uh, cities and try and see how walkable they are. Uh, ultimately, they are my own subjective view of how cities work because, um, you know, all cities are different. So I've only done cities that I have personally in the last five years walked through extensively. Um, and one, one thing that I will point out before I go into the scores is that one thing is very clear. Weather plays no role in it. I'm telling you this because whenever I talk about this, in every city I go to, they'll say, yeah, the weather is not conducive to walking. If you tell this in Singapore, so it's too hot and, hot and humid. If you go to Beijing, they'll say the air quality is not good and it's too cold in winter. If you go to Delhi, they'll say it's too, cold, uh, too hot in summer. In London, they'll say it's always drizzling. So the point is, every people who live in whichever city they think are assume that their city is unwalkable. So I'm just assuming that since it's all cities are, from a weather perspective, equally un unwalkable. <laughs> and let's see what the scores are. Actually, Singapore does very well. You come out at number two. Uh, don't get too proud, because I haven't included a few cities like Amsterdam that would probably do better than you, but I didn't have enough information. But nevertheless, well done. Uh, Zurich is by far the most walkable city I know well enough uh, to have been able to score it. Munich does well. Hong Kong does almost as well. So you have competition in the region. Uh, and it goes down. And US cities, the best US city is New York at number 10. Uh, the Manhattan, of course, is very, very walkable, but the outer edges of, uh, of New York do break down significantly. Um, since we are in Singapore, I might take you through the scores. There's one category where you don't score above nine, which is connectivity. That's partly because of your horrid taxi system, which breaks down whenever you need it, um, which is important for walking, because you see, the biggest problem for walking in Singapore is actually not the heat and the sweating, but rain. And whenever it rains, the taxi system breaks down. <laughs> so that is the reason you have not got a nine there. But other than that, you do pretty well. Um, and let's see the cities that didn't do so well. Um, 
And you can see the number of Indian cities there, which, uh, which I mentioned, the Indian cities uh, do very poorly on this matrix. Um, the worst city there is, of course, Johannesburg, which not only has bad infrastructure, but is also very, very unsafe. Uh, so safety is a very critical part of walkability, particularly in the case of women. It can be a major, major factor. So Johannesburg does well, but it's not always like poor cities do badly. So Phoenix, for example, which is an American city, Arizona, it's quite a prosperous city, but it effectively has an urban form that is effectively unworkable. So it gets a very low score. Now, just because you've got high score doesn't mean that there isn't stuff to improve on. So let's look at whether or not Singapore can be improved. And I'm going to give just one illustration of uh, something uh, that you can improve. And I, I'm going to illustrate it because I think most of you will, will have known know that area. But there are others that I can also talk about. But this particular one, all of you will actually know. And which is this place. Now, if you're walking down Orchard Road casually from the Takashimaya direction and you're sort of sauntering along, enjoying the scenery, and suddenly you hit this board that says, cross Patterson Road, use underpass, uh, blah, 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 etc. Now, it used to not be there till recently, but it is now there. And effectively, your Sunday morning walk has just been destroyed because you now have to look around to find this. <laughs> <coughs> and so you have to know. It's not just about going down one, one story to go down two. By which point, if you don't happen to be a local, you have completely lost. Because there's no signage there, and there's lots of shops. Uh, and then you sort of figure out where you go, and you sort of finally find this link. And then again, you walk around. And my, by the way, the, the design, I think, is... I have, a, I have an odd feeling that the, the real estate managers of ION are, meanwhile, trying to deliberately dissuade you from leaving that building. So... <laughs> so so if you manage to <coughs> go past it all and have not got lost and have not got dissuaded by all the, the real estate and uh, the, the retail that is being flashed at you, then you will finally reach here after four and a half minutes. I'm a reasonably good walker and I know my way around. And it still took me four and a half minutes to get to the other side. There's one poor tourist standing there, as you can see. He's completely <laughs> lost. He's he is completely on the wrong side of the, if the barrier. He, if, if he wants to go to that Patterson link, now he'll have to climb over this thing. And this is terrible. And I can't believe that people can't see this. Now, I know what the LTA will tell me when I point this out. They'll say, yes, but there are cars who are going to, you know, going to that whole crossing has cars, and it's an important crossing. And people are, and my view is, if anybody is going to wait for four and a half hours, I want those guys in the cars to do it. Why should the guy walking be spending that four and a half uh, minutes uh, going up and down? If anybody has to do it, they're in the air-conditioned car. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanyo, for the very interesting presentation. May I invite Mr. Sanyo to take a seat, please? And uh, may I also invite the panelists to take your seats? Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, after the panel has some discussion, we'll be opening up to the floor. And uh, please state your name and organization before posing your questions or comments. You may use the mics along the aisles. Uh, may I now pass the time over to Professor Butter and um, the panelists. Professor, please. Um, good afternoon. It's great to see uh, such a large audience here. Um, my name is Paul Butter. I'm uh, an adjunct professor in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, I'm also a, a, a transport consultant, uh, ma mainly working on parking, and I don't get such enthusiastic audiences for the dry subject of parking. Maybe I need to, to, to make it a bit more sexy somehow, yeah. But uh, it's great to see so many of you here. So without further ado, I'll hand over to the first panellist who wants to say a few words, uh, Mr Andrew Fassam, who is Senior Director in Urban Planning in the Conservation and Urban Design Group of the URA. Yep. Thank you. Um, well, I thought I'd, I'd take the opportunity is just to share a bit about how we plan the city, you know, building on, on Shan, uh, Sanjeev's uh, sharing. And you know, really, we see the city uh, is in our planning and urban design, we, we are trying to actively promote a pedestrian-friendly and walkable city. It's a very, very important component of our planning. In terms of building up a pedestrian network. We really see the city uh, 
the city network on three levels. Our key focus is on the street because we believe that the street is the primary uh, space for people to interact uh, and for people to access the various developments. So we have a whole series of open walkways within the roads, uh, covered walkways and linkways integrated within developments and also through block pedestrian links. We supplement this with a secondary network, uh, a basement level of underground links, and then in certain high pedestrian locations, a tertiary uh, network of elevated links. And these come together to form a very comprehensive network of uh, weather protected routes, which is very important for our tropical climate. Of course, the origins of the covered walkway lie back in the shop, uh, shop house typology and the traditional five foot way. But today, all developments in the key precincts are guided to include a covered walkway fronting the adjacent streets. And the width of these covered walkways is uh, carefully planned and varies depending on the location and the anticipated traffic that we see uh, using it. Collectively, all these uh, covered walkways and open walkways come together to form a very comprehensive network at street level. And we mentioned you know, the idea of a city that's attractive and, and pleasant to walk. So within the key precincts, we also make sure that all the developments that front onto these streets also include activity generating uses such as uh, uh, retail units, uh, cafes, restaurants, etc. So the streets are active and vibrant. Within the city, we have a very extensive rail coverage, and the stations are generally planned at like six to 800 uh, meters center to center. So all these stations are also under, located underground. So what we've planned for is a very extensive uh, network of underground pedestrian links within the key precincts that extend from these underground stations. And these are located primarily in the Orchard, uh, Central Business District, and the Marina Bay areas. And as you can see from the slide, when we've completed these, we'll actually have a very, very comprehensive network of almost 29 kilometers of underground pedestrian links, which I think puts us in a very good standing with many other international cities. These underground links are very important because they provide direct, seamless, and convenient connections for commuters and pedestrians moving between the various developments. And for the Marina Bay area, in future when we've developed all the, the area uh, in its entirety, each and every development is planned to be linked at the basement level and then connected into the MRT network so that there will be real seamless connectivity, an alternative all-weather pedestrian connections below the roads to allow people to move. We also talked about safety and the attractiveness of the city and the pedestrian network. So we guide that the underground pedestrian links, are, you know, in terms of their width and the floor to ceiling height, to make sure that they're you know, quite spacious, attractive to use. We also guide that there's activities generating uses such as shops and, and cafes along one side. And the government actively encourages the development of this underground network through cash grant incentives and also for uh, nominal premium in terms of the subterranean space. So we are actively developing the network. In terms of the elevated network, which is what we see as the, the third level, this is really planned in very high pedestrian traffic areas such as Orchard and the Central Business District and also Marina Bay and across major roads such as the example here at Collier Quay. Within the CBD we've planned for uh, elevated linkway that connects through the CBD and into the new development area at Marina Bay and this comprises of a series of second-story links that are located within the developments and 
from these links you can access into the office lobbies, into the food courts within the developments. So it's very easy to move around uh, in all weather comfort within the area. At another level in our city planning, we're also conscious to develop a series of through block links and view corridors. And these really occur at key selected areas within the city. So we have major spaces such as the plaza at OUB or the Change Alley link through, through, uh, uh, linking through to Collier Quay. We also look at opportunities where we can create additional pedestrian links. And this is a good example where we've actually worked with other agencies such as the Public Utilities Board to deck over parts of Stamford Canal at Orchard Road to create a second pedestrian mall that also links into the MRT network at Marina Bay. Uh, sorry, at, uh, at Somerset. And we feel that there's opportunity to also look at the pedestrian network and our placement of through block links and view corridors to provide a sense of orientation and link together various different spaces. So for example, a, you know, a couple of examples at Marina Bay where we guided the development of one Fullerton to create this view corridor and pedestrian link from Collier Quay through to the bay. And when it came to developing the other site on the opposite side of Marina Bay, at Marina Bay Sands, we also guided the developer to break up the very long frontage with two major through block links and view corridors which connect from Bayfront through to Marina Bay. And you can actually see through to the City Hall area from the Bayfront. So again, it's starting to create a more dynamic relationship between spaces within the city. And then finally, just touching on you know, the idea of cycling. You know, the agencies, you know, M Parks, LTA and URA have heeded the call and we are now actively looking at a much more comprehensive cycling network with supporting facilities such as bike parking, etc. And one of the areas that we're working actively in implementing this as we develop the area is Marina Bay and we have a very extensive cycling ne a network of cycling paths that we are planning and these will be complemented by supporting facilities. We're looking at bike sharing, bike rental, as well as parking facilities. Thank you, Mr. Fassam. I was uh, so engrossed by looking at the uh, bicycle <laughs> network. Uh, <laughs> so, um, next we have uh, Mrs. Ong Ko Wina from the LTA. Well, I must say, uh, Sanji has um, said something very interesting, which um, I think I may have to um, explain the rationale behind this um, non aggregate crossing. Uh, sometime back, as you all know, that everybody is allowed to cross aggregate, and then um, the pedestrian along this Patterson Road is really, really thick. And those people who are on the road, whether you're in the cars or you're in the buses, you will notice that the, wait, the waiting for, for these cars to turn right from Orchard Road to Patterson Road actually is quite, quite long. And although we have this flashing green man and things like that, but most people don't abide to it and they try to dash across the road. So as a result, they took a lot of time from the... Um, for the, the, the cars to actually pass by. And this has actually caused a lot of traffic jams along the way. Now, um, yes, you, you may think that why is LTA giving priority to the, to the road users, especially the car owners? But we must not forget that car, it's still not just car owners because there are a lot of people who are still traveling on the buses and they are the ones who also suffer. And everybody is wanting to have a very good transport system. They want to have lots of buses coming to the bus stop and calling at the, the time that is uh, required of them to come to the bus stop. But with all this, um, uh, what they call um, heavy tra pedestrian traffic, it does impede the flow of the buses. So as a result, um, with 
the um, ion actually um, developed. It was then thought that it is actually a good thing to have the pedestrian um, crossing under the road. Firstly, it is more pleasant environment. And secondly, of course, you get distracted. For the ladies, I'm quite sure you don't mind being distracted. Because when you want to buy anything, it's never 15 minutes and then off you go. For the, but for the men, it could be just a 15 minute thing and pop, pop, and out they go. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. For the men, not so pleasant. For the ladies, probably it's okay. <laughs> And uh, now Mr. Stephen Goh from the uh, Orchard Road Business Association. I will talk to LTA later. Let me show you a picture first. <laughs> uh, I'm from the Orchard Business Association. Of course, I represent the business concern as, as well as commercial concern on Orchard Road. Uh, I just put these two uh, pictures together. Uh, it's very interesting. One taken about 100 years ago, and uh, this is the today present Orchard Road. Uh, a few key elements remain. Uh, first, first and foremost, we see that it's a tree line orchard road. Till today, we still have beautiful tree lining orchard road. In fact, we are very proud. In fact, uh, we always tell our visitor, orchard road is a pride of Singapore. And uh, where else can you find a, a shopping street like Singapore? And especially when you travel around the world, you can see that uh, orchard road is like no other. And uh, we should be very proud of orchard road. We have a tree line boulevard. And uh, you can see can people walking. You also can see car, and same thing, you can see people walking and you also see car. So it's the same, right? <laughs> and uh, you also see retail activity started, you know, the hawker. Uh, most probably it's an illegal hawker. But in today, you come to Orchard Road, there will be licensed up selling ice cream. Uh, so the key elements are still there. Till today, we still struggle. The negotiation is still between the motorists and the people occupying Orchard Road. So there's a thinking uh, in our association is that if Orchard Road is designed for motorists, you'll get car and you build more car park. But if Orchard Road is built for pedestrian, you will get people, right? And uh, a walkable city. So the debate will still go on. I mean, the, we are very passionate about the crossing of this uh, Patterson Crossing. And uh, while I do agree there will be a power of, of uh, a traffic, but that is bearable because they're sitting inside the aircon. Whether for people who want to go the underpass and come out, and actually it's very stressful. If you want to be a volunteer as an ambassador of Orchard Road, please come down to Ion and the Patterson Junction. Every day there will be tourists get lost there and they need help. And why you put so much stress on people walking across the streets? And that is the only, only stretch of the street uh, block. In fact, the whole stretch of Orchard is 2.2 kilometers. And uh, that is an important crossing. Uh, so we're trying to negotiate with the agency to see whether can reopen even during the weekend. But uh, the dialogue is still ongoing. Perhaps you can, the audience can add some pressure and uh, <laughs> help us you know, with the forum you know, to reopen Orchard Road. All right? Thank you. OK. So thank you very much, Stephen, with that. Um feisty response which helps to energize everybody for the question and answer and we have plenty of time now so we, I already have two at the front please go to the microphones provided and um, if you wish but it, it makes it friendly if you, ad you identify yourself uh, so that we can respond appropriately uh, hi everyone hi everyone I'm uh, an urban designer my name is Goran Kemka I'm an architect as well and I have my own practice um, I'm actually going to pose a question to Ms. Ong, uh, uh, where, you know, walking is on kind of like line of sight. Um, and when you kind of go into like the Patterson Road link or from Fullerton Hotel to Fullerton Bay, and Andrew, you were talking about how the view corridor has been opened up, but you can't cross over over there. And I was walking with Amanda Burden, who's the town planner for New York, and she herself said that it's a pity you have to go underground from Fullerton Hotel and then go up to one Fullerton. So, that whole line of sight travel, um, which I think, I don't know if it's because of commercial interests or otherwise, even MBFC, the waterfront, it's killed at, in front of MBFC because it's all underground. And Andrew, you seem to stress on uh, how there's so much underground linkage for pedestrians being created. And I think that's a travesty because we're killing on ground 
pedestrian travel, which is where all the action happens. Cities, people want to be out as well. They want to interact with nature. They don't want to be in air-conditioned environments at all times. And line of sight, easy travel, like you said, uh, is very important. Uh, so I, I personally, as an urban designer, stress upon that. And I love Chinatown, being able to walk everywhere. Uh, we should take cars underground wherever we can, or make cars wait. If you look at Shibuya, if you look at Shinjuku, I mean, millions of people cross those streets, the cars wait. And I think that's extremely important. That's where Singapore, on your score, I believe fails much more than what you've shown. You've been very generous <laughs> today. <Okay>. Thanks. <laughs> Directed initially to, to Ms. Ong, but then I, I think maybe other panelists may have a quick response I think more to that. To that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To Ms. Ong and Andrew, no, um, I mean, thank you very, very much for the comments. I mean, I, I, I structured the, the slides I showed because I wanted to emphasize that we do place the primary focus on the street level. And I think that is important. You know, I mean, we always uh, actively benchmark ourselves against many of the other cities. And uh, of course, we, we get invariably compared to Hong Kong. And we feel that you know, Hong Kong, you have a high, much higher popu I mean, population, much higher density in, in the CBD. So they have an extensive second story network. But we're conscious that we wouldn't want to go that route because we want the street to remain active. I mean, that's part of you know, the tra you know, our tradition. So our primary focus is making streets walkable. And I think that our difficulty, you know, uh, um, our ongoing work is to balance that with the vehicular traffic. Um, so where we are developing the underground network is really as a supplementary network. And I think that there's been a lot of debate about why don't we build more overhead bridges along Orchard, Orchard Road. We had the first one go up, it's not open yet, uh, in the Somerset area. But we've been very fortunate in that our underground rail network, is, is all the stations in the city are, have been built underground. And that then allows us to build on that and extend from the stations under the roads to the adjacent developments. So. It really is seen as a supplementary network uh, focused around the stations. And that's where we talk, you know, and Sanjeev highlighted, and you know, it's something that LTA is looking at actively, the last mile, the first and the last mile. So it's to get commuters to come in, promote the use of public transport, and then be able to conveniently access from the station to the surrounding developments within a, a 400 meter uh, sort of radius. I mean, you mentioned the, the couple of examples, and um, particularly the one at Collier Clee, where you went with Amanda Burton. Um, I, I think a lot of the planning of the city is, has, you know, over the past, been focused on uh, vehicular traffic and making sure that the traffic moves slowly, uh, smoothly, etc. cetera. Um, we are trying to now pull that back and balance it with making uh, a lot more pedestrian friendly and auto oriented uh, precincts. Um, you'll be pleased to know that we actually uh, called a tender <coughs> recently to appoint a consultant to help the agencies work on a new plan for the civic district, which will also extend to the one Fullerton area, um, Fullerton Hotel. And we're looking actively at how we can improve connectivity uh, between the various developments and, and preliminary discussions with LTA is that we can seriously look at uh, reducing down some of the road carriageways, say you know, around the St Andrews Road area, around the Padang, and make the whole area more walkable. Um, one of, we hope, recent uh, successes is that you've seen in the media over the past few months, we've been talking about Club Street and Anxian Hill, uh, Anxian Road, a temporary road closure. And we went ahead and closed the road last Friday and, and Saturday evening. And I think that was, uh, looks like it was a very successful uh, trial. And we'll be carrying on that with for the next, uh, next three months. So we're looking at where we can uh, add this additional layer of uh, 
pedestrian connectivity, walkability. It may not always be that we can close the roads, and we have success successful examples of pedestrian miles at uh, Bugis area with Albert Mile at, at Chinatown with the Smith Street, etc. So sometimes we can't close the road because we do need it for access. I mean, we talk to the stakeholders at Club Street. You know, they off, you know, they operate. You know, restaurants that need deliveries. They operate offices and you know, graphic design. You know, uh, uh, offices. They need to the access. So we can't close the road on a permanent basis. But what we can do is to have a more flexible and fettered approach, where you know, if access isn't required in the evenings or the weekends, then we clo we can close close the road and at least to make it more pedestrian friendly environment when people are going down to eat and drink in the evenings and we'll be starting the scheme at uh, Hadji Lane next weekend so hopefully this is the way that we can move forward in our planning and uh, start to reclaim a bit more of the city for for pedestrians and also for cyclists as well Um, if we are still talking about the Orchard Road area, then um, at the moment, uh, as, you, as you are aware, during the weekends, in fact, there seems to be more traffic on the road than on the weekdays because everybody is, is um, going in to do their shopping. So the traffic is actually even heavier than during the, the weekdays going to Orchard area. So that's why when, when you mentioned just now that you're still talking to LTA, uh, to see whether there's there's a chance for the um, at grid crossing, I think our engineers are still figuring all the figures to see how how we could could help in this area. Um, but I'm an architect, so I'm, I can't really answer for 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 the engineers. So maybe that will be done by another department. <laughs> Um, I think OBA need to be a bit more responsible and cognizant of what OBA says. Eh? This is the second opportunity I've seen OBA heard trying to push certain things. Now, to me, the problem, I live on Ocho Road. I'm very familiar with Ocho Road, okay? I'm very familiar with crossing. There's a photo of me sitting in the middle of a crossing where your link way is over the bridge at Somerset. On the Sunday Times paper, check the archive, it's there. They are creative way to do it. The problem with the that crossing, I know it's challenging from traffic as well as pedestrian. And I'm still not sure which is the correct decision. Huh? But my sense is that the solution to it is much simpler than what Oba is trying to say. Okay? Now, if you look at the link way from uh, um, Ion to uh, um, Wisma to Nian, it's quite discernible, it's quite intuitive, and you go, go a long day without getting lost, okay? CityLink, same thing. Beautifully done. Now, the same developer as CityLink, now, when he comes to ION, he twisted the whole exercise to psychological retail, and that's where the problem arises. So you see, I think that, that link way from the escalator down to link to Wheelock, if only that has been preserved at the public space first, and then the retail corridor second, it would have solved a lot of problems for the pedestrian. But at the moment, it's more retail first, and pedestrian nothing. And that's where the queue is totally lost, you see. Now, if they reorganize it, same use, same way, same material, same pattern, same clue, wayfinding all the way through, I'm pretty sure at least 50% of the tourists will be known how to go from Ion to Wheelock reverse. Because I walk there every day, yeah? Um, I so so I think there's an also. easier solution than that, trying to re-engineer the traffic light. I used to love the traffic light because there's a way to cross the traffic light much faster than half the crowd. Because when you come from the orchard station, you can go one halfway because the traffic is stopped, right? And then make a new turn. And then everybody standing on the, on the pavement, you're halfway there, on the island. <laughs> And then when the traffic turn, you're up home read and they're still crossing the other half. Anyway, that's a secret. Now, I think, I think uh, uh, parties should not try to force something without really doing the homework. Okay? So I think 
when now you think about it, and you think about it, there's a way to make the wayfinding a lot more discernible, so that people can find their way around. Okay, you don't have to re-engineer the traffic light. I mean, I would love it too, but then you cause the other headache to the people. See? So it's not a win-win situation. It's either I have the more right, or the car has the more right. Nobody wins in the, the day. Right? Now, um, I want to make a comment regarding this presentation. I may be wrong, but I get the messaging that is quite economically driven. Because there's a lot of um, emphasis on economy and commerce and da-da-da-da-da. But there's one very important intangible which I think is quite critical to any city that you want to create that's workable and that's security. I think he mentioned it frequently in that one small bullet point, connectivity. Right? Safety, he did mention in the five points, but security is somehow this lot. Now, I want to make a comment on the, the network that I think and I'm glad that Andrew was able to explain the three levels of connectivity. I think historically and culturally, and I think what you are doing is really building on a good foundation. Ground level is always the best way to connect, okay? And I think their decision was whether to go above ground or below ground. They have decided to go underground. Okay? Hong Kong did the above ground. It's one of the best connected world system above ground. So I think somehow you already decided to go underground for their own reasoning, right? So I think give them a bit of time now. Eventually the networks will come up. Okay? Now, your, your comment about bicycling is nothing new in Singapore. The first prime minister used to bicycle to and from work every day in 1963, or was it 1959? So, so historically, we used to cycling, and OCB is trying to re-engineer that pastime back, right? So kudos to OCBC, thank you. I think there's a comment, I don't think it is. I, I just wanted to share one thing, is that actually, you know, the solution lies with each and every one in the room, you know? We all prefer to drive rather than take public transport. And it's a personal choice. And if we believe in a walkable city, we should all stand by and give up the car. I mean, I've been in Singapore for 20 years, and I spent 17 years taking public transport, taking taxis, taking the train, taking the bus. I used to get the bus to work and stuff like that. And three years ago, I went over to the dark side <laughs> and I can't imagine giving up the car. But you know, it's, if we all believe in it, then we should also all follow you know, Sanjeev's example and cycle and walk to work. And I think there is now a growing you know, momentum and you know, many of the CEOs amongst the agencies, our chief planner, for example, give up their car and either get public transport or cycle to work at least once or twice a week. And this is something that we can all do. And it's a balance. You know, the road crossing at Patterson was taken away because traffic, you know, vehicular traffic is so heavy. Then we don't drive if we want it back. I mean, it, there is a, a, a simple solution in, in, a, in a way. For your information, I never owned a car before. Congratulations. I, I, Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, Can I speak? Can I speak? Yeah. yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jean. Uh, I'm with the Society of Tourist Guides. And I've seen um, Singapore grow over the years. And we have a space crunch. As far as um, tourists are concerned, we want them to come to Singapore. Uh, we need to ferry them on buses. And uh, we want to encourage them to walk and enjoy, for example, Orchard Road as well. I think the challenge in Orchard Road is to find a place where we can safely uh, let our people get off the bus. Right now, we are, we are squeezed for space. Quite often, we use the, the, the space outside Mandarin Hotel and they get off on the wrong side of the road. The traffic is going to the highway, right? So there's very few places where we can safely drop and safely pick our passengers up again. So that's one of the challenges that we face because I, I'm not sure whether I'm wrong, but um, tour buses may not use the public bus stops. 
and there are no bays where we can alight. So that's one of the, I mean, for planning, perhaps if you are going to relook at Orchard Road to consider that. Another place that we have a problem with space uh, for getting people off the coach would be Little India, for example, at the, uh, at the, outside the um, arcade, outside Teka Centre. Um, so I think there should be some consideration. Otherwise, it's difficult for us to, to get people to enjoy Singapore and say it's a walkable city and get them to the drop-off point. So I'm talking about connectivity. I think that's one of the issues. Right? Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're asking a, a planning question, but I just address as a business question, uh, answer to you. Uh, it's true that it's uh, very hard to find coach parking bay on Orchard Road. And uh, those designated uh, parking are actually uh, related to the hotel. And uh, the only exception is, I think, duty-free shop that they allow coach parking. Uh, there again, not enough coach parking. They could park behind the residence, and so we get a lot of complaint as well. So I think coach parking is a, is a planning issue and uh, we also uh, try to work with uh, uh, Natas to uh, work out some arrangement whereby they can park in the uh, URA car park but also because of constraint or infrastructure, uh, we couldn't do it and uh, so we hope this question will be open for the planner to rethink you know, uh, some of these ongoing logistic problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Gideon Ashwan. I'm from the Future Cities Laboratory. And I have a question on, on two parts, actually. The, the first part is we always talk about Orchard Road and Marina Bay Sands. Um, I don't live in Orchard Road. Um, there's 80% of Singaporeans live in the heartlands. And walking there is a very difficult thing. What, was, what is the approach of the URA of improving that? Because what Sanjeev is, sh is showing in, in Orchard Road is the same problem in, in many places that you have six lane highways where you can't cross, so you have to walk 400 meters one way to get the other, uh, across the road and go back again. Um, that's one part. And then the second part is why do we make a walkable city? Um, I see it here, it was mostly as a question of economic um, advantages, like you, you make people walk so they interact with your economic um, enterprises like restaurants and retail. Um, what about health? What about mitigating transportation problems like the LTA is addressing constantly? We have um, a lot of buses and uh, we don't have an alternative on the mode choice. We cannot go by bicycle because unfortunately if I'm riding down Clementi Road, it's the bus lanes or like the streets is not, very men not, men not meant to be cycled on. So why do we build a, a walkable city and what do we do in the heartlands of Singapore where most people are living? key precincts that, it, that seem to be the focus. Um, does anyone want to pick that up? And then the second question was other reasons besides the uh, uh, economic reasons. Um, as you are aware, um, LTA has just embarked on this very ambitious plan of um, providing walkways in heartlands. We are um, planning about 200 kilometres of uh, covered laneways. And if you take the, com the circumference of Singapore Island, our island is about 193 kilometers. So we are actually more than the, the, island, the, the, the circumference of Singapore Island. And we are going to do it within five years. So it is a very ambitious plan. We, we, we know we want to create a, uh, um, the last mile, the first mile and the last mile, so that at least people are then encouraged to use the transport mode. So um, I just hope that you have a little bit of patience while we are now planning and actually moving ahead with this program to make uh, walking more pleasant. As for cycling, um, I mean, our city was not planned today. We planned our city many years back. And during that time, because of the economic boom, um, vehicles are actually the thing to, it's one of the drivers for this economic uh, development. Um, but now everybody is um, thinking differently. We, we are trying to, to, to make a balance between um, what is more convenient and what is more sustainable. So uh, we are trying out in um, seven towns now with these cycling um, paths. 
Um, again, like as I mentioned, the towns were developed much earlier. So um, we have to make use of um, the footpaths. Where we can, we try to widen it. But of course, in so doing, we are actually taking away the greens. And we want the greens too. So we have to strike a balance. Um, but in the future precincts, in, um, in some areas we do, you know, we, we try, but then if you take away the road lanes, then you have a lot of outcry from the other people. So it's either here or there. Uh, we can't satisfy everybody, we can't satisfy everyone, unfortunately. So for the new precincts, we are actually looking into um, increasing the road reserve and then hopefully then we have more space for the cyclists. But meanwhile, we will have to learn to be more tolerant with one another if we have to share the footpath with the cyclists. I'll just uh, put a few words, uh, put in a few words uh, here. Um, yes, uh, <clears throat> you did raise the issue why my indices didn't have security. Actually, I have included it under safety is security is, is the same category. No, 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 I have, but it's a category, so it's a category, right? Each category, like pedestrian thing, doesn't only sidewalks, there are all kinds of things under it, so each is a category. There's a 20% weightage, so it's pretty heavy. In Singapore, it's not a major issue. If I was making this presentation in Delhi, I would have stressed a lot more on it. So that's why it says a major category uh, in, in there. I hadn't, maybe. Um, now, the discussion about uh, uh, cycling, I will say that it has dramatically uh, improved. Uh, let me point out, uh, so I have lived here off and on since 1995. And um, you simply couldn't cycle around the city in 1995. It was much, much worse. Uh, maybe in 1950s, uh, people, the Prime Minister was cycling, but by 1995, nobody was cycling. Um, you couldn't. So since 1995, now 18 years, there has been a dramatic improvement in the cycling. Yes, um, there are many soft issues as well around cycling in Singapore, including the fact that uh, uh, the drivers don't give any space for cyclists, and many of the cyclists simply don't have any driving etiquette. They're driving like they're uh, walking. On, on. So there is a lot of soft uh, issues as well that need to be resolved. Nevertheless, there has been a dramatic improvement because, of course, I myself cycled to work uh, for the last uh, year, little over a year. Um, but there are many, many small stretches now that you can cycle. And uh, from my discussions earlier um, uh, uh, last week, uh, uh, I gathered that many of these are now going to be linked, right? So that there will now be actually a fairly uh, large um, cycle network, off-road cycle network, which will be quite impressive once all the stuff that you just saw gets done. So, to LTA's defense, uh, I think um, I, I think there is um, there is some. I mean, you you have dramatically improved from where it used to be not so long ago. It's just the effort of all the ministries, not just LTA. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Raymond Kwok from Oxford Economics and VC dot com. Uh, it is one of the <laughs> CLC lecture whereby it seems to be there's a lot of uh, to and fro between the audience and the panel, and it seems to be one is attacking, the other one is defending. I, I, I'm not trying to, you know, say that which one is right, but I think that just now the last comment by Sanji is right. I mean, if those of us stay in Singapore, you appreciate there's a lot of improvement, and I, we are a city in the making, and I think there's a tremendous uh, improvement. But uh, one thing, uh, just share with you my experience. I used to be chauffeur driven, but now I'm retired. So now what I do is either drive or take the public transport. I enjoy it tremendously. I'm so surprised that the public transport is so connectable. And I wish most of us try to do that. Because either on buses or on MLT, the only thing is that this is the temperate climate. You know, I mean, uh, from, from uh, Tanjung Baga, I take a short walk. I thought we got trees, but then you know, there's still a lot can be done. But I don't think that there's anything you can change the weather. Un unless you make the do Singapore in the doom. But I'm just trying to ask that, uh, is there any way that we can sort of literally look at different ways? I understand that uh, we are not looking at GPS to look at the, the charging our system. Because when you put a gantry on, the drivers basically will find other ways of going past it, and the other road without ERP will be jammed. Okay, I'm just trying to share with you some of my experience. I'm on some of the highway which are literally jammed, 
and another highway whereby it is. I think that there are also a highway whereby you're going to work and coming back is two different traffics. I'm talking about basically, literally, transportation of human beings. I studied in England before and the transportation, public transport is fantastic and a lot of people take it. But here, I think the transport system is good, can be better and it will be better. And I think that most of us, if we try to sort of drive and park, I remember there was one in the olden days, we have that. I do. I drive my car to one place whereby I have a free parking, another condominium which I own. I just take an MRT. So, I mean, those are the smart travelling that we just need to adjust ourselves so that we can accommodate, you know. I love to walk. I mean, nowadays, uh, I'm much more healthy now right, compared to in the past. <laughs> Maybe, you know, can share with us some of the, 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 the future that we can see uh, to help us to, uh, you know, move a little bit better. So, if I can paraphrase the made one point about restraining traffic and the whole issues of COE, mm -hmm. etc. Perhaps we'll pass on that one, but we'll take the, the, the positive side, which is perhaps more relevant to walkability, which is how to make it more attractive well, to use all, of those, all of those alternatives. Does anyone want to tackle well, that's kind of a big picture question, but you know, just very briefly, if anyone has, a, has an angle on that big question. I think uh, a lot of the discussion has been too focused on Singapore. I think this is a much wider issue. Um, Particularly because uh, while there are obviously, as I said, Singapore scores very high, it's far from perfect. But you have to take into account how other cities are. And I'm talking about really advanced cities. I mean, I'll give you the example of uh, New York. And Amanda Burton may have uh, said many things. Yes, Manhattan is very walkable indeed. But anything outside of Manhattan, New York is essentially unwalkable. And by the way, security is a major issue. If you go onto a New Jersey side, you may walk, but you'll probably be dead. <laughs> you'll be the walking dead. <laughs> uh, uh, because, you know, there are places like Trenton, etc., are absolutely dangerous in midday. I mean, not even at night. So there are many other issues. So uh, New York as a city is not that great. And it still scores the highest in, uh, in the U.S. I mean, they have... Other cities, as I said, Phoenix or some place, if you go out for a walk, uh, you'll probably get arrested because there must be some, you know, the police will think of doing something, it's doing something very odd by walking around. Um, so let's keep that in context. I mean, even this Patterson thing that I brought up, I apologize if I've just... Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, fact is, it is really fine-tuning uh, when compared to some of the issues that you have in many other cities. Uh, and I'm talking about cities that are otherwise considered very, very walkable. Um, and of course, uh, uh, cities that I uh, am used to in India um, are just uh, awful places to walk, which is sad because it's a poor place. A uh, large proportion of the population would walk because simply they're poor, poor, too poor to buy motorized transport and would benefit enormously from walking systems. Uh, but in fact, uh, public policy deliberately skews um, um, you know, policy to the other side. And just to give you an example, in the last decade, major government project in most Indian cities which have spent millions of dollars in something called road widening. Now, road widening is euphemism for actually getting rid of the sidewalk. <laughs> and huge amount of money has actually been spent to go backwards. So, so uh, I think it's important to keep that in context. I mean, yes, we are, they are, uh, Singapore is far from perfect, but most places in the world are much, much worse. And that I particularly true of US cities. Uh, but even in Europe, uh, there are you know, lots of uh, issues. Yeah, so um, just before we go to the next question, I'd, I'd like to echo that, that maybe we can look to the wider region. Many of us here work in the region. There are many Singapore firms consulting in India, China, Vietnam, etc. And I, I saw a figure today that over the next 20 years or so, roughly as much built space as already exists in the whole world will be built. Much of it in, within a five hour plane ride from Singapore. Much of it heavily influenced by the example of Singapore. So maybe you know, thinking of ourselves as either a good example or a possible warning for others. We'd rather be a good example than a warning for others. Professor, my uh, Q for A is uh, for Sanjeev and Andrew. My name is Marina, Audacity decision maker, and I'm a genuinely contented Singaporean. So no questions on Singapore. Instead, I would like to ask uh, on your expert opinion on two cities, uh, for New Delhi and Bangkok. 
because both are known for their density as well as their traffic, both human and car uh, vehicular. What do you suppose would be the big change you like to see and know that is needed in the fastest time before the year 2020? Thank you. I'll tell you about Delhi because that's a city I know somewhat better than I know Bangkok. I have gone to Bangkok several times, but I, I haven't thought about solutions. I've mostly just looked at it as it is. But I can tell you about Delhi, where I have worked on solutions. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, this is, and, uh, walking solutions, uh, one of the things you've got to realize, yes, there are some common things, but very often when you're looking at big, big transformations, walking solutions have to be bespoke to the city that you're dealing with. So this is a solution that I think Delhi can do. Many other cities can't. But you see, Delhi is a very old city. And Delhi has been built and rebuilt over hundreds of years. And so there, in fact, there are old Delhis. What you now call old Delhi was one not so long ago, New Delhi. And there was an even older Delhi. And they all built on top of each other. Now, all of these guys, at one point or the other, required water. Uh, Delhi is on the edge of a desert, so water is an issue. And there is a river called Yamuna which flows. So all of them built all kinds of canal systems to supply water to whichever city was at that time the major city. Some of these canals are hundreds of years old. And as a result of this, Delhi is very interesting because it has 360 kilometers of these old canals, which now are called drains, but they're actually originally canals for supplying water to various older Delhis. And they crisscross the city, and they're still there, largely. Now, my uh, proposal uh, has been, for the last few years I've been proposing, is just to connect these and turn them, these, into walking paths. They are great because, because they're canals, they are kind of contiguous, straight, uh, not straight lines, but at least lines of, and they crisscross the whole city. And they would be fantastic as walking and cycling paths and would transform the city completely, particularly since Delhi now has a spanking new metro system, which is actually quite good. The problem is, when you get out of the metro system, you actually, uh, the, the last mile, you're really stumped what to do. You come out of this really first world metro system into a complete third world um, road network and walking system. And this network of 360 kilometer um, drainage system uh, and turning it into um, a road system would dramatically change Delhi. I mean, you, would, you cannot even imagine how brilliantly this would change, open up Delhi as a place to live, uh, as, as a transport system, and so on. Sadly, um, uh, the current thinking process is entirely to the opposite. Uh, many of these drains are actually having new elevated roadways being built on them because they are contiguous land, as I said, so that it's easy to do that. So unfortunately, one by one, they're getting used up. I think it's not just a travesty in terms of uh, um, transportation and walkability. It's a travesty even from a uh, preservation perspective because some of these canals are very, very old. And some of Delhi's uh, uh, best uh, uh, old architecture uh, you know, are along these canals. And instead, what you now have is this you know, a 14th century old something with a huge thing going over it, a huge road thing going over it. And it's just awful. Um, so that would be a solution. Uh, I've been campaigning for it, but I, I'm sorry, I've not yet succeeded. <laughs> hey. uh, hi, my name is Shauna. Um, I'm a landscape architect from National Parks. Um, so I, I kind of work for the government as well, right? So, yeah. Um, but. I think my question is kind of directed not only at the speakers, but at all of us. Um, and that is, I think, at the heart of it, how committed are we to actually creating this walkable city? Because if we are really committed to creating this walkable city, then our discussion today shouldn't be about transport systems. It shouldn't be about connection. It's not about connecting people from place to place, but it's about the experience of moving from place to place, which I feel that um, it's not something that we've been talking about for today's discussion. Um, in terms of thinking about how, um, when we talk about walkability, it's not just about moving people from one spot to another. It's also about um, waiting and stopping. Is that being encouraged in our city? Um, I, think, um, that's, I think in Singapore, I don't actually find enough places where I can sit and just, um, just have a chat with my friends and um, yeah, just, just interact with one another, which actually contributes to what makes a city something that's enjoyable for people. Um, 
Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think instead of just talking about um, just the different kind of achievements that we have, I mean, even for national parks, we talk about creating park connectors. Um, for LTA, if you're creating um, covered linkways, are we thinking about how um, this experience um, actually helps people? And in terms of a walkable city, um, it really requires, if we are really committed to this, it's really about thinking about paradigm shift altogether. It's not about starting from the cars and then thinking outwards, but really starting from the pedestrian and thinking outwards. Um, and if that's the case, then I think a lot of policies, a lot of things that we're doing right now would actually be not, will be things that we're not actually doing right now. So yeah, that's just a comment that I had. Thank you. That, that to me, seems to me to echo one of your points, which was that you're starting with walking as the backbone. We, we tend to think of MRT as the backbone and everything else is complementing MRT, uh, whereas saying walking as the background and MRT is kind of like a, a very fast yeah. walker later, you know, um, it's a different perspective. But also in Singapore, of course, we've had kind of a Corbusian death to the street kind of approach. Uh, maybe we need to overthrow that approach. Is, I, I think, I think uh, Hong Kong Centre or Hong Kong is a very, in, uh, very interesting example of uh, uh, walking as backbone. Because, uh, and the, the use of other forms of transport as um, accelerated walking. Because everywhere, that all kinds of mishmash of different kinds of transport that you have, including escalators, which I think is a fabulous way in which they have done this. I mean, Sadly, it's not true of all of Hong Kong. It is true of the center of Hong Kong. The rest of Hong Kong isn't so cool, but, <laughs> but the center of Hong Kong definitely uh, works very well. And uh, there are some advantages, I agree, to the underground way, but the overground way has another, one very big advantage, which is the line of sight. Um, so I'm not trying to convert you. I know where, where you're coming from. I'm just pointing out that, that, that um, their way of looking at it for Maybe they got to it by chance or whatever, but uh, the center of Hong Kong genuinely is really walkable um, and in some ways is a great example of, of this kind of thinking. Yes, hello. Um, I'm actually very new to Singapore, um, but one of the things that surprised me when I first arrived here was and we can talk about physical structures and the way that we build roads or not, but n n we haven't mentioned the culture aspect of walking. And it, very, it surprised me a lot when I, when I came to Singapore that a lot of people that I know personally, they wouldn't even conceive, they wouldn't even conceive going from home to a hawker center walking. It's always get the car or just even parking to go to you know, the supermarket. They have to park as close as possible. So, <laughs> Culturally, it is not just about the infrastructure because there's a perfectly walkable paved road. So it's not just about going and having the right infrastructure and, and, and you know, physical structures to walk. It's also about the mentality. And how can the government tackle such you know, cultural challenges? And it reminds me of Mexico City. We had the same, the same problem with bike, uh, cycling. And the government pushed very aggressively this policy to promote cycling. And I was wondering what can happen in, in such societies where maybe walking is not the first option uh, culturally to get from point A to point B, uh, especially in, in young people. It's something that, uh, how can the government or how, what can we do to promote walking as a cultural uh, aspect, not just a physical infra infrastructure uh, problem? Thank you. I think you're very right. Um, Singaporeans are really pampered, over pampered. Um, so much so that um, they are demanding a lot of things that no other country citizen would have dreamed of actually asking. Um, I, I don't know whether this generation of people uh, will adapt themselves to using the uh, to walk. Uh, most of the time, you hear everybody say, "Wow, oh, so hot, man!" You know, and and everybody wants to go into the into the aircon space. That's why I I think you already also thought that actually having the UPN is a very good solution because we actually solve the problem of this heat and rain that we we constantly are subjected to, and so that you can walk in comfort. Um, 
uh, but unfortunately you, you lost the, the, the line of sight once you're underground. Um, so um, back to this thing, I, I, I suppose um, it's really um, trying to change the mindset of most Singaporeans. Like just now, one of the, the um, guests was saying, um, in fact, if we really want to make sure that um, this walkability works, how many of us are prepared to just put our cars aside and walk? In fact, maybe a show of hands may not be that many who is prepared to do so. See, it's not many. <laughs> but maybe when the car prices get too expensive, you've got no choice, you may <laughs> then say, OK, la, forget about a car. Let's walk and take the public transport. But then I'd also ask the question, why haven't you so far? Because uh, you know, it really is a, you know, a, a matter of, of, of literally walking the talk. I think you know, in response to the question is that, as always, it's going to be a mix of things that you know, the government and the, you know, the respective agencies will take the lead to put in the infrastructure in terms of you know, walkways, uh, covered linkways, cycle paths, etc. It's for us, you know, as responsible uh, citizens, to also take the lead to, you know, say, walk the talk, you know, give up the car when we can, walk to the local hawker centre, to the shops, etc. I suppose you know, we will probably move. We talked about you know, change from ERP to GPS. You know, as we move forward, there's the option of you know, really pay as you use you know, road pricing. And that may in itself also change behavior. So, you know, for example, rather than drive to work, then drive home, and then say, OK, uh, I need this to cook. I will drive out again to the supermarket, or I'll drive to the petrol station to, to pick up, you know, to fill up the car. If it's a question of pay as you use, then you will start to change behavior. And I make one trip in the car to do all these things, and I'll drop by the supermarket on the way home. The government doesn't need to take that approach. We can all do that as conscious citizens by actually saying, OK, well, you know, I can reduce the number of times I use the car, the amount of time I'm, I'm actually driving on the, on the road by combining trips, you know, by planning up front that I'll go and do this and this and this. So, I mean, there's a lot that we can do, and it's going to be a whole series of, of you know, measures by the government, put infrastructure in place, and then I think uh, you know, ultimately you know, changing behaviour, uh, and hopefully a lot of it will come from ourselves to change our own behaviour. Um, let me defend Singaporean culture. Partly because I'm not Singaporean myself, I can probably do this without uh, being apologetic. The fact is, Singapore, for its level of income, has the lowest car ownership in the world. So, partly because it's very expensive, you're right, but the fact is it's low. So I don't know, uh, you must have very rich friends, but uh, if you're hanging around with people, everybody who has got a car to go wherever they do, then maybe you should make friends with more normal people. <laughs> <laughs> because not many people in Singapore can afford a car, uh, quite frankly. And frankly, they have very, uh, even the relatively well off, uh, you know, in, in, in um, uh, uh, where they would have two cars, will have one, and, and so on. So the car ownership in Singapore is genuinely lower. So Singaporeans actually do walk. And the fact is, uh, because of the way the... Uh, and incidentally, in the heartlands, yes, it's not great uh, as you may wish it to be, but the fact of the matter is, the heartlands were built with MRTs in mind, or they were built simultaneously, roughly. So they are... In, they do interact. As a result of which, um, uh, if you live in a um, uh, HDB area, uh, the likelihood that you are serviced by uh, public transport of some reasonable quality is very high. And I have myself lived briefly uh, in an HDB area, uh, and I was surprised how good it was. Um, so uh, I would say, in fact, Singaporeans do have a culture of uh, walking. They may whine about it, they like whining about it. That's part of the culture. <laughs> But they don't actually use very much, partly because they don't have very many cars. 
and partly because um, I mean they don't really need to to, to service it. they are reasonably well uh, serviced uh, talk about building a culture uh, how about close Orchard Road once a month every first Sunday of the month we have closure Orchard Road actually it's Certain part of Orchard Road is, uh, is, is possible because uh, from, the Paris, uh, from the Patterson uh, Junction to the Biddeford Junction, the only two ingress to car park is Tong Building and Lucky Plaza. So uh, they say if Sunday morning you can close this stretch of Orchard Road, which is about 600 meters, uh, Patterson Road is still possible, Biddeford Road is still possible, so you still can go around and go to the Raffles City or Handy Road area. So I think... Uh, this is for future thinking, uh, that if Orchard Road can be closed once a month, it's for me to persuade the stakeholder that this is doable. So we can do a deal. If the planner will work with us, I will work very hard to persuade all the stakeholders to agree to this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, okay, we have two more questions, one here and one here. And while we're waiting for the microphone, I'll, I'll just echo this idea of um, the idea of just occasionally opening streets to the people, not closing. Open streets is the word we should use for, yeah. for, for taking away the traffic is opening the streets to people. Um, one of the things about people and vehicles is habit, whereas these occasional events shake us out of our habits and so they're very powerful. Yeah. And I have a feeling the uh, takings on that day in Orchard Road would go up compared to the usual Sunday, so it might be, might be successful. But we have a question. Uh, my name is Idris. I'm from uh, Singapore Polytechnic. Uh, not really a question, but just a comment. I think if different parties are here, uh, like maybe and Park, you know, as part of discussion panel, maybe the the discussion would have been skewed in a different fashion. You know, what I mean, and it's quite interesting that I got uh, one person just now commenting. Uh, he's a she's a landscape architect, and talk about experiential walk. I think that's very important. And apart from that, I think what is important is the fact that uh, we should also look at uh, serial killer. I mean, sorry, serial serial vision. <laughs> yeah. Uh, serial serial vision. I think that's very important. The idea of identifying where you're going as a form of orientation. Although it's, I think it's very very important. And when I talk about walkable walkable city. Uh, can we perhaps discuss on uh, mental walkability? Meaning to say we can actually look at things and capture in photographic uh, projection in our mind how we should move in a city and identify certain landmark and things like that that allow us to move on or that would actually promote or encourage us to move on and identify the city as a whole. Spiritual, mental, you know, uh, walkability of a city. That's another, another aspect in which perhaps we can discuss on. Yeah, just a comment. Thank you very much. So just perhaps um, before you answer, um, you, you're referring, referring to the Swedish Vision Zero goal of zero road deaths. Is that what you were mentioning? Okay. Okay, yeah, that, that part I understood. I was just trying to clarify one, one little thing. Okay, carry on. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, a there's the issue that has brought about the experience of walking itself, of wandering. And I think that's a very important issue. We have not brought it up here. Obviously, there's a limitation of time, and I didn't stress on it. Uh, I really think that's a very important part of the experiences of a city, um, just to wander around the streets. Um, with no particular aim, economic or social or anything. Um, because, and in, incidentally, that has huge economic value too, but I, since it seems to br bring up Hankels, I won't bring it up. But a um, lot of ideation happens while walking uh, for genetic reasons. We were, we were born to think while walking, incidentally. There's a lot of people have written about this. Um, but um, the experience of walking, and the, they call it the spiritual experience or the aesthetic experience, is a very, very important part. And it relates through, to, interestingly, to the idea of memories. 
people like walking around areas where they have attached memories of some kind, uh, which also links with uh, preservation uh, of older precincts. And one of the things Singapore does do, and I'm, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a detour, but it's important that one of the Singapore, uh, things that Singapore doesn't do too well is that it doesn't attempt too hard, uh, till very recently, to preserve um, ecosystems uh, which are failing and just allow them to be, just because they're part of the memory of a place. Um, because sometimes ecosystems then evolve themselves into something completely unpredictable. Um, so the randomness of cities uh, is partly allowed by that. Uh, and it's part of the, that is part of the experience of the city too. And I think, for, I think, I think there's more appreciation of this in recent times. But I think uh, this business of, oh, it's beginning to fall apart a little bit. Let's go in there and spruce it up and clean it and paint it. At uh, some point in time, that has got to be, that has got to stop. <laughs> okay, we're coming up towards the end, but I believe we could take one or two more rounds of questions. Um, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Faye from the National Arts Council. Um, I read an article recently um, from Art Plays, an organization in the U.S. Um, they they started to to use walkability as a an indicator for how vibrant and um, like an arts vibrancy kind of um, uh, an index a study. Um, so I'm really curious. I guess besides the tokenism of of having you know an art piece sitting somewhere or you know maybe a busker you know situated at a specific spot for visibility um, beyond that um, have have you sort of encountered um, situations where partnerships with between city planners and and such um, with with artists um, that that kind of partnership and collaboration has really um, assisted in the vibrancy and walkability of a city thank you Um, in fact, LTA is now working with um, the art gallery to actually create a um, sort of a walkway incorporating your artwork along the walkway. So, um, should we, are, we are still in the discussion stage, but we, um, definitely this scheme is going to come through very shortly. Hi, Adeline uh, from HDB. I'm not going to ask anything related to the HDB, um, but maybe uh, through my observation, uh, through my travels, I realized, especially where I spent time in Perth, in Australia and Sydney, where I had to personally walk for half an hour to my university. So in a way, it actually forced me to walk you know, under the condition of the rain or whatever, sunshine and stuff like that. Um, are we then in Singapore making it too connected such that you know, we lost the essence of you know, being walkable? Because we now rely too much on public transport or for cars, uh, where we link ourselves from buses then to train, and then we lost that totally about you know, being able to walk from point A to point B. Yep, that's my question. Thanks. Maybe I could just add a dimension to that question. It's along the same lines, but rather than sort of trying to take something away from people just to make them walk, which sounds a bit too extreme. But yeah, but um, so point taken. But there is one uh, thing that maybe we could really use in Singapore, which is very frequent bus service. Right now, the headways of buses outside of peak hours is, is typically 13 minutes, 14 minutes, 15 minutes, too long to wait, really, especially for, for you know, middle income, upper middle income people. So. But how can you get higher frequencies, you know, shorter headways? It costs money, or this is the one that I've been pushing, is simplifying the bus network. So instead of having such a complicated tangle of bus routes so that most people have a single ride and relatively few transfers, a simpler bus network, more of a grid, but also slightly longer bus stop spacings in some locations. We have fairly wide spacings already, but um, you wouldn't make quite such a big effort to get a bus stop within 300 meters of every every HDB block, for example. You might allow, you might recognise that if the headways are very short, people are willing to walk a little further to reach such a service. Now, so people are gaining something, but they're losing something at the same time. So there's a trade-off. 
but walking is part of that trade-off, which is fine for those of us who are you know, young and strong and able-bodied, but there would be people who would complain about it. So there would be a, a vigorous debate, and so maybe there might be something to comment on there. Sorry, uh, just an anal analogy. Uh, just, uh, I was concerned about you know old folks having to climb stairs, and he actually gave me this comment: if you take away the stairs and you install a lift, I become less healthy because you took away that mode of transport for me to become healthier. In response to that. Response? <laughs> Dangerous ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your dad must be one of the rare ones. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, have, we have received lots and lots of requests from the public to make it more convenient for the elderly to actually um, go up the, the POBs, our pedestrian overhead bridges. As a result, we ended up now have, um, coming up with this new program to actually feed up 41 of our um, uh, pedestrian overhead bridges with lifts so that it is more convenient for the elderly to, to move. It is a, it's, it's a concern, it's, it's, it's things like mobility. As you, as you grow older, your, your, your legs are not as strong as you used to be. So one fine day, you will, you will end up with this situation whereby you, you, you will find that the lift is actually um, an asset to, to you being able to move around uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, something like your, your dad said that you, know, you, you lost that ability to, to, to climb because um, we have provided the lifts. I mean, the choice is still there. We, we didn't nip off the staircases. If the legs can still take it, yes, please use a staircase, but you can't. There's another alternative, which is the lift. Hi. Uh, just a quick question, going back to cycling for a second, uh, because you were talking about uh, layers of uh, connectivity experiences, and uh, also obviously about uh, getting from point one A to B. Uh, we spoke about bicycling and how Sanjeev, you find it very easy from where you are to uh, get to where you uh, want to. Uh, I've tried a few times from Holland uh, Road to get to Chinatown, and believe you me, it's a nightmare. Uh, to the extent that after three accidents, I gave up cycling. Um, and, uh, but the point that I was trying to make was, again, about layers of connectivity and why uh, or does Singapore have a plan to uh, allow you to take a bike to MRT or get it onto a taxi or get it onto a bus and have the framework for it where you have bicycle stands in places, well, maybe covered or otherwise, and you have showers in offices. So that whole framework of trying to create a multimodal transport system is something which I think Singapore could improve on again. And I don't, I'd love to see, hear your viewpoint on that. Actually, I really appreciate Raymond's comment. Singapore is, remember, work in progress. I think a lot of common verbalized here are very impatient. Uh, don't forget, Singapore is only less than 50 years in the making. Now, you go to Paris, for example, They've gone through all the rapid development, growth and development. They have cultivated a culture called planner. It comes naturally. It's a walking city, it's a bicycling city. So I think, see, what, what happens uh, if you look at a city that increases GDP a hundredfold within less than 50 years, there's little adjustment for people to move to something which is by choice. And to me, walking to walk or not to walk it's a state of the mind. It's your choice, you see. It, you cannot, by, or by coercion or by behavioral design. You cannot, but to a certain extent. So what I'm getting at is that I think in another X years, I'm pretty sure there will be a certain healthy proportion of Singaporeans, like my good friend here, I just met him today, Abel, Raymond and myself, who will decide to walk sometime, decide to bicycle sometime, decide to take the bus sometimes. But at the moment, you see, when the, when the first, the one within a generation, you go from walking to bicycling to bus to MRT and cars to get them off the car to walk, 
is a difficult thing to do, you know. But, but my, my sense is that give it some time. It will come. Naturally, it will come. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, if I may, I have the privilege to sit next to two pretty ladies. <laughs> they don't want to speak, but I, I, I know. I know. <laughs> one lady is from Cologne, from Germany. The other one is from Nice. Both of them I'm asking, you know, in your city, you know, what happened? They say historically they have a city center. They have a lot of walkable space because this is historic developments. As John was saying, that, and I just now I mentioned, Singapore, we are 50 years old and we are developing. Now, my question is this. How do we see from the panel, uh, how do we see going forward, five years from now, 10 years from now, what do you want to see? I know that a lot of us seem to be pushing for walking, walkability, cycling, but at the same time, if you think about it, I am now not having to go to work in the morning, but if you imagine everybody have to go to work, it is a nightmare during that peak period. So I'm just sharing with you that, you know, during a, a, a time where you have to move from A to B, you make, and make the decision what sort of mode of transport you have to do. Sanjit, fantastic. I mean, you're able, I know that stretch is fantastic. You know, you're able to bicycle because your time is flexible. You're okay, you know, to adjust your time. So I'm, I'm just wondering that, you know, as we move along, uh, as the society starts building, how do we accommodate all different modes of transport, allow people to be able to do business at the same time, leisure. I think leisure, we all like to walk. But when you have business, very difficult. Um, okay, so what I think we'll do now, just by the way, for certain trips, cycling is faster than any other mode, so I dare say yours is faster than any other yes. alternative. Uh, but what we'll do now, I think those three comments were sufficiently general that what we'll do now is we'll have our wrap-up from the panellists, take it in turns, roughly two minutes of reflections, and uh, any, any final words that you'd like to get in while, while you have a chance. Okay, I think the mission of LTA is to provide um, cost-effective and efficient mode of transport to serve the needs of all the people. So uh, we are trying to strike a balance for all people with different needs and it is a tall order. Um, but I think we all uh, do appreciate that um, sustainable the um, mode of transport is the thing for the future and definitely LTA is moving along that direction. No, I, I agree with John. I mean, one, one comment that from the audience that stood out was Raymond's, you know, you're, uh, you're, we're a city in the making. Um, we're also a city in the remaking. I mean, we're cont continually relooking at where we are, you know, how we can improve. And I think you, know, you, you mentioned you know, what can we see as we move forward. You know, I think that you know, the government, all the individual agencies, you know, they all recognize you know, the shortcomings that we have you know, in terms of you know, road congestion, congestion on the rail, you know, the idea of you know, uh, more, more effective cycling network, etc. And we're all working very actively on that. And I think that we will, over the next five to 10 years, see significant improvements. You know, LTA is, is you know, continuing to build more rail lines so we get greater coverage, more connectivity um, across the island. And you know, we're all very much taking on board all the comments and the, you know, the, the feedback uh, from, uh, from, from Singaporeans. You know, I share with you, you know, that our CEOs and the ministers go out cycling together on a regular basis, doing different routes, you know, trying the different park connectors, you know, identifying where there are you know, gaps in the network and then coming back and, and discussing with you know, the, the agencies how we can follow up and improve on the network. So there is a real effort to develop the cycling network and I think that will be one of the priorities in the next few years and we should definitely see a much more extensive and connected network. Uh, one thing that um, uh, crossed my mind and, and I was, was sort of related to the comment, uh, I think the lady from, from HDB who, who was talking about um, you're walking to work. I mean, it's, it's true. When I, when I was living in the UK, I used to walk 
30 to 40 minutes to work, to work in the morning across the city and, and walk back. I mean, I think one of the key things is the difference in the weather that you, um, I, you, I would be re you know, really, really stressed to, to do it. But I think the other thing is that you know, if I walked from home to, to, to work today, it would take one and a half hours. So one of the things that in terms of the planning, and this why is it's not just one thing, it's many, many different levels of planning, is that we are looking actively at more mixed use, bringing more jobs to where people are living so they don't have to travel long distances. So within the city, within the CBD, we're encouraging more residential development, more mixed use development, so we get people living closer to where they, where, where they work. And vice versa, we're creating more jobs closer to you know, uh, the, 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 new, the new towns, the HDB estates, so that it is much easier uh, to access where you, work, uh, where you work, work. And I think that also will start to have a difference as we move forward over the next five, five ten years. And I think on a social level, um, there is also now amongst companies and com amongst government agencies, we're seriously looking at how we can uh, have more flexible work arrangements, whether it's like staggering working hours, having more e-commuting, e e you know, people working from home with you know, advances in technology, you know, this is possible. So I think it's going to be on multi-levels and that uh, hopefully over the next five, ten years, we will see another transformation and we'll be able to look back and... I mean, you mentioned whether we can be a exam leading example you know, in Asia. Hopefully, we, we can. And we can do it in time for, for the rest to also learn the lessons from us. Um, let me add to that. I mean, basically, um, Singapore is a work in progress, but all living cities are work in progress. There's no such thing. A city which is not a work in progress is a dead city. Think Venice. Um, so it, Singapore, will, it's not that it's in work in progress today. It'll always be work in progress and may it always be work in progress. Um, and to move on to that, I think much of the discussion today was about what the government can do about this and that. But I think there's a lot of things, not just us, but the private sector can also do. I'm mean, a very simple thing that I benefit enormously myself is the fact that my office put in showers. So I, I can change at work. So that is a small thing, but it, uh, it has uh, uh, enormous uh, benefits from doing that. And as far as cycling, you're absolutely right. They're, I am lucky that I happen to be in that corridor that works, but there are now more coming up. Um, but I am going to raise the stakes. I want to actually kayak to work, and I can do it. <coughs> because I've discovered that I can go from where I live to my office on water and I've been trying to get the right person, PUB or National Board or whoever, who can tell me how I can get off on the other end. I know how to get on on my side. <laughs> if you tell me that, I will kayak to work too. <laughs> you need kayak parking at your office. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I showed you the picture when uh, beginning the, the, the session. Uh, the orchard of today is a result of government vision. Uh, as a Singaporean, I think we should be proud of our government have this vision of creating such a beautiful orchard route. It's not perfect, uh, work in progress, uh, if I may borrow. Uh, but definitely, I think if we can work together, we can make the place better for tomorrow. And uh, so we will continue to uh, look forward to, to, to work together and align each other's vision and uh, for the betterment of our children. Oh. I, I'm not going to add anything further. I've already injected my opinion here and there where I probably shouldn't have. So I think um, I'd like everyone to join me in thanking our panelists for a very stimulating event. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for the lively session. And may we now invite um, our executive director, Mr. Ku Ting Chai, to present the panelists with a token of appreciation. Thank you, thank you panelists. Once again, may we have a round of applause for them and um, for a group photo as well.
Oh, they certainly left us with uh, a lot of uh, food for thoughts today on how to make um, our city more livable. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of the lecture. We thank you once again for the participation today and we look forward to seeing you again.